Good morning. I'm excited to start off the month of October with you guys. Um, we can keep sprinkling pumpkin spice on stuff, but it's not cooled off yet, guys. So um, I've, I was going to start with all this encouragement about cooler weather, and then I spent the day at the ballpark watching my niece and nephew yesterday. I was like, oh, yeah, no, it's really, really hot still. But um, God is good. <laughs> the seasons will change. Uh, we can trust that. So my name is Rachel Armstrong. I'm the director of student ministries here. And that means I work with our sixth through 12th grade students primarily, but also do some things with our college students and young adults. Um, I'm also married to Pastor Jacob. Uh, If you didn't know that, he's he's proud of that this morning. So that's good. Um, I'm glad he's claiming me. Um, So I've been around since the beginning to see what God has been doing here at Providence Church. And if you were here three weeks ago, you know we celebrated our 15-year anniversary. And uh, that was an amazing service. Um, Thinking back over the moments that have shaped who we are as a church family, moments where God taught us that he can be trusted, And then reminding ourselves of the vision that God has given us as a church to see those who feel disconnected from God and the church find hope, healing, and wholeness in Jesus. Um, And Jacob reminded us of the story Jesus told about the lost son who the father ran to meet when he came home. And uh, it was our first Sunday with our prayer kneelers. And when I saw our church family coming forward and kneeling and praying that God would send more sons and daughters home, I just wept and cried all three services. Um, it It was a really powerful day. And then two weeks ago, we had a baptism service and we had over 50 people who were committing their lives to Jesus, recommitting their lives to Jesus. And I wasn't the only one crying that day. I saw some of you sharing this meme online, you know, when the the worship's good. (laughs) And that was accurate. I had people passing me Kleenexes from behind me. So, um, and then last Sunday, we kind of continued that celebration as Jacob shared the way that we feel like God is calling us as a church to live into our vision in the future. And we talked about our purpose is to partner with God. And we looked at the scripture where Jesus tells his disciples um, that he wants us to partner with him in making more disciples. And I really want to be a disciple, and I know a lot of you really want to be a disciple, and we just said a disciple is someone who's an apprentice of Jesus, someone who has opened their heart and their mind into being fully trained by Jesus. Um, So I told you that I cried a lot over the last few weeks, and especially at our 15-year anniversary service, and I know there were multiple reasons I was crying. One of them is that when I feel the Holy Spirit moving and working, I just have to cry. I can't hold that back. Um, Another reason is that I was happy. I mean, it's really amazing to see what God has done. 15 years ago, we were a baby church who fit in our living room, and now we're this beautiful gathering of people seeking God together and able to do um, so much um, when he allows us to work together in that way as his body. Um, But I would also like to be honest with you and share that I, I think I was also crying because I was tired, And I was a little bit weary when I look back on 15 years sometimes. Um, For every amazing thing that has happened, we've also walked through some really hard things as a church family in 15 years. For every prayer that was answered in the exact way that we hoped it would be, we've had other prayers that um, weren't answered in the way we hoped God would work. Uh, And I think there's just the reality that we're in the middle of so many prayers, right? There's so many situations where we're waiting to see what God is going to do. We're praying, we're asking, and we're just in the middle of the battle. And I think I was just um, overwhelmed with some of that in that service as well. And um, I want to share with you how God helped me give some language to what I was feeling in that service. So in September, I took part in the Monday night series we had here called Practicing the Way, and it was a study on prayer. And no matter how long we've been following Jesus, I don't think any of us ever feel like we've mastered prayer. So it was so encouraging and good to come together and focus on um, just being with God in that and continuing to practice so one week, we were encouraged to try this way of praying called Lectio Divina. Lectio Divina means divine reading. And it's a way of reading scripture very slowly and very prayerfully and listening to see if a word or a phrase might stand out to you as you're reading. And then you read through it again and you contemplate, like, what, what would God be saying to me through that word or phrase? So I want to share the passage of scripture with you that I read one night for Lectio Divina. It's from Mark chapter 8. And it's about the feeding of the 4,000. So you've heard of the feeding of the 5,000 probably more frequently, but this is the feeding of the 4,000. 
I want you to experience it the way you would if we were practicing Lectio Divina. So get comfortable, take a few deep breaths, and ask God to speak to you um, through a word or a phrase in this scripture that I'll read. About this time, another large crowd had gathered, and the people ran out of food again. Jesus called his disciples and told them, I feel sorry for these people. They've been here with me for three days, and they have nothing left to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will faint along the way, for some of them have come a long distance. His disciples replied, how are we supposed to find enough food to feed them out here in the wilderness? Jesus asked, how much bread do you have? Seven loaves, they replied. So Jesus told all the people to sit down on the ground. Then he took the seven loaves, thanked God for them, and broke them into pieces. He gave them to his disciples who distributed the bread to the crowd. A few small fish were found too, so Jesus also blessed these and told the disciples to distribute them. They ate as much as they wanted. Afterward, the disciples picked up seven large baskets of leftover food. There were about 4,000 men in the crowd that day, and Jesus sent them home after they had eaten. So I don't know if any words or phrases stood out to you, but when I was reading this passage, what jumped out at me were the words, another and again. And that surprised me. This felt like barely random words to stand out to me. But the verse where they come from, verse 1, about this time, another large crowd had gathered, and the people ran out of food again. And when I read through the passage a second time, and I was contemplating why these words would have stood out to me, um, I began to wonder, how did Jesus feel about having another large crowd he had to feed again? And I recognized that the way that made me feel was tired. You know, I was tired on Jesus' behalf. And um, I looked back in my Bible to see how long ago was it that he had done the feeding of the 5,000. And it's just a few pages before in Mark chapter 6. Um, if you read chapter 6, 7, and 8, it seems to be days or at the most weeks between the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000. And I began to wonder, why does Jesus have to do this miracle again so soon? I mean, couldn't the people have learned to pack a lunch? Um, shouldn't be his job to miraculously provide buffets everywhere he goes. Um, and as I continued to kind of sit with this scripture and those words, I recognized that I was feeling a little tired and weary about all the anothers and agains in my own life. And I think all of us can relate to that. Um, we all have um, another of something we have to do, another bill to pay, uh, another fire to put out at work, another loved one who gets a bad diagnosis, another loved one who lets us down and we have to forgive and work through it again. And all of us have things in life we need to do over and over again. Do the laundry again, pay the bills again, go behind your kids and turn off all the lights in the house again. That one's very personal to me. Um, and, and even in our walk with Jesus, there are things that we do over and over again and again, right? We come to church every week again and again. We pray again and again. We open our Bible. We, we join another Bible study. We go to another small group. We attend another retreat. And I want you all to sign up for the women's retreat. Hear me. Um, so it's, it's the nature of life that there are things that we do again and again. There's ways that we serve again and again. You know, we're going to do the turkey drop again, another feeding miracle of our own church trying to be like Jesus. And we'll, at Christmas, we'll find... Um, children and families that we can love on and support, but we're gonna do that year after year and the need just keeps coming back, right? And sometimes we can just start to feel tired and weary about doing it all again. So I began to pay attention to the anothers and the agains that Jesus was experiencing and I tried to pay attention to how he responded so that I can learn as his apprentice, as his disciple, how I might respond to them. So I want us to look back at the first miraculous feeding Jesus did in Mark chapter 6, um, and actually a little bit before it, kind of what had been going on in the life of Jesus and his disciples before the first miraculous feeding. So this is Mark 6, 30 through 34. The apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour and told him all they had done and taught. Then Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. He said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. So they left by boat for a quiet place where they could be alone. But many people recognized them and saw them leaving, and people from many towns ran ahead along the shore and got there ahead of them. Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. 
So he began teaching them many things. So we see it's already been a busy season of ministry leading up to the feeding of the 5,000. Um, Jesus' disciples, his apprentices, had gone out on a ministry tour. They were trying it. They've been learning from Jesus, and they're going to go out there and, and try to do ministry on their own, and they come back to report. And I can imagine the conversation from what we know about the disciples, like, oh, Jesus, listen to this. I was preaching the good news in this town, and like a whole family believed, and they're going to follow you. And another disciple says, Jesus, in your name, I healed this little girl. It was so amazing. And then John says, Jesus, you won't believe this. I cast out a demon in your name. And Peter's like, well, I cast out two. And, you know, they start arguing like they always do. Um, and Jesus, I'm sure, celebrated all of that with them. And then he told them, there's another practice of mine that I want you to emulate, and that's to go off alone and find a quiet place to pray and to reconnect with God. So they get on a boat, and they um, head to what they think will be a quiet place. But, you know, what happened when they got there and they got off the boat? The people had come after them. And um, I think we can all relate to that feeling, too. So you've probably got your coffee, and you've opened up the Bible, and you're really ready to sit down and, and have some time with God, and then someone needs you. Something happens. Or you take a few days off of work because you know, I'm, I'm really worn out. I really need to rest. And some crisis erupts that you have to deal with. Um, we all know what happens if a mom tries to go to the bathroom alone. Like, the people come after you. Um, so this is, this is something we've all experienced and when Jesus had this experience, when he couldn't get the quiet and the peace he was hoping for, Mark 6.34 says, Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat, and he had compassion on them. So he taught these people, and then he fed 5,000 people. And if you keep reading after chapter 6 into chapter 7, it's just um, another season of Jesus' life where he's doing the same faithful things over and over again. He's teaching in another town the Pharisees come and they argue with him. They come against him. He heals several different people. So chapter 7 is just more of the same another and again that Jesus is always doing. And then we come to the passage that we read together already in Mark chapter 8, the feeding of the 4,000. And that first verse there says, About this time another large crowd had gathered and the people ran out of food again. Jesus called his disciples and told them, I feel sorry for these people. They've been here with me for three days and they have nothing left to eat. And what I see is that Jesus had compassion for another every time. Jesus had been doing the faithful work for all of these chapters. This was the season he was in. And when he hoped to get away for some quiet and it didn't happen, what welled up inside of him was compassion for these people. Um, and so when I see my master and my teacher responding in that way, um, I want to be willing to emulate that. I want to be like him. So I've decided to get rid of my t-shirt that says, I can only please one person a day. Today isn't your day. Tomorrow doesn't look good either. Like, right? This is not the spirit of those who are following Jesus. So, you know, that, that, if Jesus had that t-shirt on, this story would have played out very differently, right? So, so Jesus had compassion for another every time. And we, his disciples, want to find that compassion for another every time too. Another thing I noticed in these chapters is that Jesus was willing to teach the same lessons again and again. When Jesus fed the 5,000 in Mark 6, he was teaching his disciples. He asked them to feed the crowd, and they said, with what? And he showed them how with, with him, nothing is impossible. He can take the little that you have, the little boy's lunch of five loaves and two fish. He can bless it and break it and multiply it and feed thousands of people. So when we get to the feeding of the 4,000, just a short time later, Jesus tells his disciples to feed the crowd. And you think they would say, got it, Jesus. We remember this one. We'll find the kid with the lunch. We're going to let you bless it. Everyone's going to be fed. But that's not what they say. Instead, they say, how are we supposed to find enough food to feed them out here in the wilderness? It's like they weren't even there. I'm like, guys, this was like a chapter ago, and you already forgot how this works. Um, but Jesus does it again. He teaches them the lesson again. He finds out they have seven loaves of bread. He finds the fish. He multiplies it. He's showing them, again, that he can supply all their needs. He can take the little you have and make it more than enough. So I definitely can identify with the disciples in this. I can be a slow learner, and I'm very thankful that Jesus is willing to teach me the same lesson over and over again. Um, I've even had to relearn this lesson a million times. God has provided for all of my needs so many times in the past, but I can be filled with anxiety about a current need and wonder, is this the time he's not gonna come through? 
Um, but I also want to learn to identify with Jesus as his disciple and become a person who's willing to teach the same lesson again and again. Not many humans absorb what they need to learn on the first go-round. So if we want to invest in relationship, it's going to be part of our work as his disciples to patiently repeat the lesson, show people love again and again, teach the same thing over and over. So if Jesus was willing to teach the same lessons again and again, we as his disciples want to be willing to do the same. Um, Another thing I noticed in Mark chapter 8 is a verse that said, Jesus sighed deeply. And I really love this one. It shows us how fully human Jesus was. So right after the feeding of the 4,000, guess who shows up to argue with Jesus again? It's the Pharisees. And he had just dealt with them in Mark 7, but here they are again. I want you to hear the scripture. Immediately after this, the feeding of the 4,000, he got into a boat with his disciples and crossed over to the region of Dalmanutha. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had arrived, they came and started to argue with him. Testing him, they demanded that he show them a miraculous sign from heaven to prove his authority. When he heard this, he sighed deeply in his spirit. All of us have people that we interact with that are difficult for us. All of us have tasks that just wear us out, that we have to do again and again. And when that task rolls around again or that person shows up again, sometimes we may find ourselves sighing deeply. And that's just a sign we're having to dig really deep (laughs) to find what we need to respond well. Um, And so I love seeing that even though Jesus was doing the good things and the hard things, he was having to take a moment to gather himself and respond, right? Jesus sighed deeply before he spoke the truth again to the Pharisees, before he showed them love uh, in a truthful way. Uh, calling to account type of way. And I don't want you to mishear me in this. I'm not saying that every relationship we're in is one to stay in. Um, Some relationships are unhealthy or they're abusive. And, And I'm not advocating for people to stay in relationships like that. But I am saying that there are some relationships that are difficult Uh, but they're the right thing for us to continue in them, to continue to love that person, to continue to try to speak the truth and teach that lesson again. Um... So when I need to do the good hard thing in front of me and I find myself sighing deeply, I'm really glad to know that Jesus can sympathize with my weakness. There's a verse in Hebrews 4.15 that says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So as we continue to think about all the anothers and the agains that Jesus faced and the fact that he was fully human like us and he had to sigh deeply to keep doing it, how did he do it? How did he find the strength and the power to keep responding with compassion and love? And Jesus went off alone to pray and be with God again and again. We saw earlier in Mark 6 that Jesus and his disciples tried to get away and rest, but the need of the crowd was too great. They followed them. They didn't get that time alone away with God right in that moment, but Jesus didn't give up on that. There's about 38 times in the four gospels where we see Jesus going off alone to connect with God, to pray, to rest. And if we, as his disciples, want to partner with God and what he's doing in the world, we are going to have to connect with God again and again. We're going to have to find another time that we rest in his presence. When I'm teaching our students, I often try to ask questions and have them respond out loud to keep them engaged. Sometimes I'll ask a question and there's like this silence and I'll tell them, hey, Jesus is the answer like 90% of the time. You know, it's like, just guess Jesus. Um, But that's backfired a couple of times where there's silence so someone's like, Jesus? And I'm like, ah, the other 10% of the time, the answer is prayer and Bible study, okay? And so um, the reason that Jesus and prayer and Bible study are the answers like all the time is because all the cliches excuse me, all the cliches are true, right? To be a faithful disciple of Jesus, we are gonna have to connect with him in the practices we know that will give us that spiritual strength over and over again. We're learning to abide with him, to remain with him. So we're going to pray again. We're gonna open our Bible again. We're gonna turn on the worship music on the bad day in the car again. We're gonna go to another retreat. We're gonna go to our small group. We're gonna do the things that will give us the power that we need to walk with Jesus in this world. I shared with you about the Lectio Divina practice where the words another and again jumped out at me and how God's really used that and really spoken to me through it. But what I didn't share is that we were encouraged to do that practice five times that week. So the other four times that I did Lectio Divina that week, nothing really special happened that I could sense. 
I'm confident that God's word and that time with him was doing what it was meant to do. I'm confident it was shaping me and working inside of me, but I have nothing to report. There is no sermon coming from them, okay? And so sometimes we just have to realize that um, the faithfulness, the repetition of doing the good things another time and doing it again is the way that Jesus is shaping us. Um, Jesus reminds us of the daily nature of being a disciple. One time when Jesus was sending that invitation out to people who would want to follow them, he said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So this isn't a a one-time thing, our baptism day, and then we're done. Being a disciple is over and over and again and again. So Eugene Peterson wrote a classic book on being a disciple that's called A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. And I just think that title sums up our calling so clearly. It's a long obedience in the same direction. It's doing the right thing again. It's taking up your cross daily. It's having compassion for another. So we have to have both kinds of another's and again's in our life to get it right. If we're going to have compassion for another person in front of us, then we're going to have to have that relationship with Jesus again and again, that time with God getting refilled Um, This morning, I was reading um, this prayer app that I try to do every day called Lectio 365, and I just loved the scripture for today and the message version. It just relates completely to what we're talking about. I want to read it to you. Are you tired, asked Jesus, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the, learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. And I was so amazed. I was like, oh, that's so good. It's exactly what we're saying. We have to keep coming to Jesus and learn from him. I'm also like, God, why didn't you give me that on Tuesday when we were making the slides? But, you know, I don't know. We just have to keep coming back again and again to get the words from him. Um, but another word that's really spoken to me recently is Galatians 6, 9. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So if there's a whole Bible verse that's encouraging a group of Christians not to get weary, that's also a comfort, right? So apparently it's a thing that's going to happen. We're going to have to encourage ourselves. Don't get weary. It's natural. It's going to try to creep up on you. But the way that we're going to fight against it is by not giving up, like the end of the verse says. So if we do the faithful things again, there are moments coming when we're going to get to see the harvest, when we're going to get to see uh, how we're partnering with God in the world and how he's using us. And I have an example of that recently from our student ministry. So for two and a half years, our team of small group leaders and volunteers and the staff, we've been working on getting more and more students into small groups. Um, We really believe small groups is where the best stuff happens, where we're really growing and building relationships and going deeper. So we have all these large events, large group worship time, fun things that we do, Um, and then we have these other nights that are small group gatherings, and we have been working to get the same number of kids at each type of event, and after about 130 weeks of doing the same things again and again, of inviting again and again, loving the kids who show up, finally in September, we had a big worship night and turned around the next week, had our small group gathering, and we had the same number. And my heart just did this little happy dance, like, okay, 130 weeks in, but Jesus is faithful. We keep doing the same things, the faithful things over and over again, and eventually we get to see the harvest, and we get to see um, what he's doing. So that's the word I hear Jesus speaking to me in this season of feeling weary, is don't give up, keep following me. I will show you how to have compassion and spiritual strength for each another you face, and every time you need to do it again. And so Providence Church, let us not become weary in doing good because we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. We have 15 years behind us as a church to celebrate, but we need to do it all again. We need to follow Jesus another day, another year, another 15 years. And when we apprentice ourselves under Jesus, when we learn from him, we stay connected to him, we see how to do it well. We see how to find his strength when we're weary. So the invitation today is to live into the another's and the again's with Jesus this week. We're going to come to the table for communion again, like we do every week, because we're going to take up our cross every day this week. So we have to come and connect with Jesus and receive the strength that we need to follow him. 
I also want to encourage you after you take communion um, to feel free to stop and pray at the kneelers. If you did that three weeks ago, I invite you to do it again. Pray for the same situation, the same person again. And if you haven't had a chance yet to do that, I invite you to pray for the first time and um, come closer to God in that way. Let's pray together. God, you are so good and you are so faithful. I thank you that you love us so much that you sent your son to invite us into a relationship with you and then to get to partner with you with what you're doing in the world, God. Um, help us to come after you again and again and help us to have the strength to have compassion for another person in front of us, another task. Um, we don't want to try to live our life separate from you, God. Help us to live connected to you, um, dependent on you as faithful disciples of Jesus. Amen.